Hello, I'm Peter Ayers, and you're listening to Stages, the podcast that converses World with the World War II gave us Rady for God and Maria. Without the arts, we are diminished. We had the kind of creative freedom. I was, I was on television as a child, and then I had I was in Cotty's happy hour. She leaned across to me and she said, one day, you know, you'll be doing that. Mind-boggling. They were even lined with purple leather. Uh, I went to the ABC and auditioned. I was so fit at the end of that, you could have ended me in the Melbourne Cup. I, and I still firmly believe that great work can be made in small places. If nobody's going to respect your talent, you've got to respect it. I hope I've been entertaining, that's all. Well, that's very kind of you, Peter. But you are a friend. <laughs> <laughs> and as are you. Yeah, it's a date. <laughs> it's a date. Hello, I'm Peter Ayers and you're listening to The Stages Podcast. Today we have a date with Opera Australia Artistic Director, Lyndon Terracini. He's a busy man. Tonight the company commences their annual season of the Handa Opera on the Sydney Harbour with a lavish production of La Traviata. To attend the opera with the glorious Sydney Harbour and the skyline framing the production is truly spectacular and one of the events that is a must-do on the Sydney calendar. Terracini, of course, introduced this inspired event when he took the reins of OA, transforming the box office into one of great triumph. Other inspired artistic contributions from Terracini have continued to broaden and re-energise the company. He is an entrepreneur of creative management and vision. 2020, however, delivered great challenge for the company and Terracini found himself forced to make tough decisions navigating one of the country's leading arts organisations through a pandemic. To ensure its survival, it's an experience none of us would desire. Lyndon lets us in on the year that was. We are also given insight to his superlative career as an internationally renowned baritone, a director, an actor and producer. And he describes the path that led him to his celebrated position at the helm of Opera Australia. Mr Terracini to the stage. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <clears throat> well, you know how to count, so that's good. Well, I thought I'd go past two, so you know I'm not a roadie. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's important as a musician to be know how to count. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Particularly a percussionist. Are you a good mathematician? Um, well, I don't think I'm a mathematician. I can add up. Right. But um, I did play percussion when I played all the brass instruments. So I grew up in the Salvation Army, so I started on the cornet. I uh, played flugelhorn, uh, euphonium, trombone, um, oh, and a bit of you know, bass and so on. But uh, Then I also played timpani. And uh, I used to, when we marched, uh, when I was playing timpani, I used to lead the march with the bass drum. So uh, you learned you know, how to keep a very regular tempo and to march at uh, crotch at 114. ba da so that, you know, if you went too fast, no one could march properly and play. 
Uh, but playing timpani too, often you'd have you know, 100 bars rest. So, yeah, you learn how to count. So is that where you got a lot of your music education, in the Salvation oh, Army? Oh, totally, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, from the age of four, I started singing um, as a soloist. There's a photo of me singing Christopher Robin and saying his prayers at a Sunday school anniversary when I was four. <clears throat> that was in the, um, the Salvation Army Citadel, or the hall, I guess, in Haybury Street, uh, Crow's Nest. It's now a panel-beating shop. Right. But um, <clears throat> that's where I started and uh, started playing the cornet there and also, uh, yeah, the trombone, UFO, all that sort of thing. And um, then uh, my parents moved to the Congress Hall in Elizabeth Street and uh, so there I started playing timpani. And uh, I'd started singing by then, so it was a combination of both really. Because there's se- several generations of Salvation Army. Oh, yeah. Yeah, with your paternal grandfather, who I believe converted from Judaism to Christianity. Well, was, was my, gra- well, yeah, my great-grandfather right. uh, was Jewish, Italian, and um, one of our relatives, Umberto Terracini, um, was also Jewish and obviously Italian. He founded the Italian Communist Party. Wow. And uh, Mussolini locked him out for 11 years or something. And uh, when he came out, he wrote the Italian Constitution with Pertini and Gramsci. Uh, but he, <clears throat> my great grandfather, uh, Jacob Raphael, couldn't get more Jewish than that, no. came to Australia, and uh, he had ten children with uh, his uh, wife, who I think was Irish or Cornish or something like that. So they had ten kids, and there wasn't a synagogue nearby, but there was a Salvation Army hall. So all the kids went to the Salvation Army, and my grandfather um, started in the boot trade. And uh, he then decided he wanted to be a Salvation Army officer. So he did. And also on my mother's side, uh, her father came off a farm up around uh, Gaira, uh, New South Wales, and he decided he wanted to be a Salvation Army officer. So, so both my parents and their wives, they met when they were training in college, so both my parents came from um, uh, Salvation Army families. Did they meet in the Army? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, in those days, you know, you, it was frowned upon to marry an outsider. Right. Um, and on my, my grandmother's side, her parents were sent out by William Booth from England to start the Salvation Army in Australia. And they were, uh, my, her great-grandfather on her side was imprisoned, I think, in Ballarat for preaching the gospel. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but my grandmother was very talented. She... Um, was a wonderful calligraphist, um, but she and she could a wonderful artist as well. But she started writing mini operas, and uh, they would perform them in the um, the Salvation Army corps that she was attached to with her husband. And uh, one of them I used to do with my my brother, Winston, who's a barrister. So I would it was David and Goliath. So I would be Goliath with a fireman's helmet on. You know, remember those old brass fireman's helmets? Yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. had one of those, and my, my brother used to sing David and serve uh, Salvation Army spectaculars. We would be in costume and, and act out and sing this sort of mini opera that my grandmother had written. So music was there right from the start? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, you know, I can't remember... Well, music has just always been the kind of pivotal thing in my life. Even when I was at school, um, you know, I couldn't wait to get home to just to practice and to play. And so I played the piano a bit and played the double bass a bit. But it was really the brass instruments that um, I enjoyed. And, um, you know, that was a tremendous training ground without me realising it for um, everything I've done since. I have fond memories of the Salvos growing up in country Victoria. Uh-huh. And, it, and every Christmas the truck would come around yeah. and they would play carols That's in the right. street. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Did you ever do that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I used to do it around here in, in, in North Sydney and uh, Mossman. Uh, we didn't have a truck, but uh, we would start on a you know, street corner playing Christmas carols. Then we'd move on to another area and play carols. And uh, Yeah, that was nice. It was, it was a lot of fun, actually. Yeah. I enjoyed it very, very much. Well, thank you, Lyndon, for joining Stages in this conversation. I understand that there are many strings to the bow of Lyndon Terracini, so we'll see uh, how much we can accomplish in this next chat. 
Congratulations, uh, first of all, on being one of the only co- opera companies in the world, I think, to be staging opera at the moment. Yeah, it's true. I uh, went to a very glorious opening night of The Merry Widow yeah, recently. Yeah. Um, so it, you must be chuffed that... Oh, look, I'm really pleased about it. I'm pleased that we could get back on stage, that we could um, you know, start hiring singers and all the rest of it. And um, I didn't want to do... We usually do La Boheme at that time of the year. Uh, we start on New Year's Eve with Boheme and then run in January. And I just didn't want to do an opera coming out of COVID with um, Mimi coughing and dying. <laughs> I just thought it was <laughs> of some hideous disease, oh, exactly. virus. Yes. Just too close to home. Yeah. So, and I felt that people wanted to lift as well. And Widow is a great production of Graham Murphy's. And, uh, you know, with wonderful performance. Performance from Julie Lee Goodwin and, and Alex uh, was just great. Um, so that was nice to do. Look, it took a while uh, for us to build an audience. We could only play to 50%. And, um, you know, people were very nervous after that Avalon spike. We'd been selling fantastically well, uh, including Opera on the Harbour. In fact, Opera on the Harbour was ahead of West Side Story at the same point uh, for Traviata. But as soon as that um, spike occurred in Avalon, it just stopped. So we had to, you know, rebuild and and continue on with that. Then uh, we did Ernani, which was great to do. Um, and at the just towards the end of Hernani we could play to 75% so that was better and then with Tosca uh, we could play to 75 and Bluebeard's Castle to 75 uh, the last performance of Tosca we could play to 100% but it was a bit late then but I was really pleased with the performances you know they were all at a really high level and I think you know everyone really appreciated the opportunity to be back doing what they do best so that was a, that was really positive. I mean, it was difficult at the box office because we, you know, had to really start all over again, and without international tourists, which have been a mainstay for us in recent years, uh, it's been hard. But you know, we're playing to a live audience, and uh, the audiences have been terrific and incredibly appreciative. Um, Incredibly um, frustrating time for arts organisations. Oh, the, the first yeah. business to really close. Yeah. Um, and you're looking around and we're seeing the football go ahead and... Uh, well, that's exactly Air right. travel. Yeah, mm. exactly. And, um, you know, it, it has been frustrating. But, look, I think, you know, seeing people feel that... Um, well, without wishing to be, mel- be melodramatic about it, feeling as though their soul has come alive again because uh, they're on stage and they're singing. And, I mean, singing at any time makes you feel better. But if you're a singer and that's what you do for a living, or an artist of any kind, um, when you're practising your art, you feel like a different person. Mm. And, uh, and it was great to see people, you know, with a spring in their step and feeling that um, their life was back to some sort of normality, if not totally. And the same with the musicians in the orchestra and so on. You know, it's... It's been frustrating, but everyone's appreciated it. And I think the audiences too, you know, they've felt that um, that time they've been able to spend in the theatre has been uh, a relief from uh, the outside world. Mm. Now, you've been at OA since 2009, I believe? End of 2009, I started, yeah. So, so quite a while. Mm. Steering an arts organisation is about vision, um, imagination and, and fiscal responsibility. Mm. They, all, they all come to the fore. Can arts organisations become too complacent, do you think, with those things? Oh, yeah. Look, I mean, I I once read, and I don't do these business courses or anything like that, but I did read once from one of these um, uh, consultant types. uh, He said that um, just when you're feeling as though you're being really successful is the time when you need to change. And um, I've always um, carried that and felt that. And so by the time we got to COVID at the end of 2019, um, I'd been with the company for 10 years. And, you know, we'd, uh, when the board first interviewed me, they asked me what I would do. And I said, well, we need to do an opera on the harbour. Uh, we need to do the ring and we need to do the big classic musicals. And we need to play some popular repertoire with great singers. And so we'd done all that and uh, the company was incredibly successful. We'd tripled our turnover. Um, more than doubled the size of our, well, in fact, tripled the size of our audience. Um, uh, we were returning surpluses, and we were able to then start to be more adventurous in our repertoire. So we'd sort of done all the things I said I was going to do, and then COVID came. So it was really an opportunity for me to think, 
well, uh, this is 10 years, so what are we going to do for the next 10 years? So I formulated, you know, plans and what I think the company needs to do. Um, and so the next period will be implementing a lot of that. And uh, hopefully it'll uh, be as successful as it was in the previous 10 years. But um, if you don't do that, I think you're absolutely right. You, you can become complacent. And because the formula has worked, um, you keep doing it until suddenly you'll get a fright because it's no longer working. Mm. And I remember when I came here, the formula of doing Gilbert and Sullivan was a very good one. And it had worked for the company. Um, but it had just gone on a few years too long. And so we did the Mikado, which is a, well, probably the best GNS production that we had. And we lost half a million dollars. Wow. And we'd been planning to make, you know, a hell of a lot more than mm. that. Mm. And so, you know, I realised that... Um, we just pushed it too far and become a bit too complacent and expected that, oh, we'll just do a GNS and we'll be fine. Well, we, we'd, um, we'd run it too hard. And so with um, you know our summer seasons where we do Boyum every year, as the Met does every year, and they've been doing it since 1973, it's still an important thing for us to do in terms of tourists, but uh, we will break it up a bit more. Uh, the musicals that we're doing... We have, we've announced we're doing Phantom of the Opera uh, in the Opera House, and then it goes to Melbourne. Uh, and we're doing um, uh, Opera on the Opera on the Harbour next year. Will be Phantom of the Opera. Wow! So it's um, we needed to make a lot of money, and um, you know Phantom and Hamilton are probably the most bankable shows you can have. Absolutely. Um, so we do the, that. But, but, but audiences are that. so used to that production of Hal Prince's of, of well, Phantom be a different so production. it will be a new production yeah, and yeah. especially on the harbour that'll be something yeah it yeah. will be yeah. yeah so that'll be exciting yeah um, but then uh, after that we'll look at you know perhaps um, choosing some repertoire from musical theatre that's still on a grand scale uh, but perhaps not as close to centre as uh, we've done in the past you obviously and, believe that musical theatre can be presented by an opera company oh look it's you know, you've got to be incredibly talented to mm. do those those shows. Mm. And also, too, they're unbelievably well written. You know, Rogers and Hammerstein were geniuses. The way they've crafted the music to be driving the narrative and the narrative to reflect what's happening in the music, it's very difficult. They make it seem incredibly simple yep. and easy. It's not. And, well, you see how many people have failed. Mm. Um, and some of the text, some of the music, I mean, something like South Pacific with uh, what it says about race relations and so on, it's just as relevant today as when it was first written. And the music too, it's just as beautiful. Yeah. You know, you sit there and, you know, when you've got someone like Teddy Tahu Rose singing This was ne- this Nearly Was Mine, it's incredibly emotional. But also supported by the orchestra that was originally Absolutely. written for. I exactly. remember seeing at the Lincoln Centre productions of The King and I and South Pacific. Yeah. And yeah. that full 40-piece... Live yeah. orchestra is just something to be It on. is. Yeah. Well, as you know, that's exactly what we do here. Yeah. And you hear those sorts of orchestrations, and it is. It's very, very different. Mm. But, you know, the thing is, people want to see those those shows, uh, even though they were, they were written in South Pacific, what was it, 1949 or something yep. like that. Um, just as popular now as it ever was. And it does have something important to say. Um, and, you know, when you examine it musically... You know, Rogers and Hammerstein were as clever as Puccini was. You know, you, you look at how Tosca is constructed. Yeah. It's theatrically, it's constructed perfectly. It's not too long. It works to, to what Puccini, to Puccini's instincts. You know, there's that first act that opens up, sets it up. You get into the nitty gritty in the second act, and suddenly, bang, in the third act. And you know, they were Rogers and Hammerstein had that sort of ability to write. So. Um, I know people will uh, think I'm, um, well, to be brutal about it, the Antichrist for doing musicals. <laughs> but uh, I think they're a vitally important part of our repertoire, um, uh, purely and simply because of the quality of those pieces. Forget everything else that I've spoken about, but the quality of the work is extraordinary. I wonder what he'll think of me. I guess he'll call me the old man. I guess he'll think I can lick every other fella's father 
sense than his pudding-headed father ever had. I'll teach him to wrestle and dive through a wave when we go in the mornings for our swim. His mother can teach him the way to behave, but she won't make a sissy out of him. Not him, not my boy, not me. He can haul a scow along the canal, run a cow around the corral, or maybe bark for a carousel. Of course, it takes talent to do that well. He might be a champ of the heavyweights. Well, some of your initiatives and changes have been provocative. Mm. I guess you can't please everybody all the time. Oh, look, I think if you do try to do that, uh, you won't please anyone. Um, There's an old saying, you know, if you stand in the middle of the road, you'll get run over. And uh, I've never been prone to stand in the middle of the road. (laughs) Uh, But doing something like uh, Harder Opera on Sydney Harbour, you know, now it's really one of the fundamental uh, events that you have to go to in Australia and all around the world. People buy tickets um, before before they know what show we're going to do. And it is a quintessentially Sydney experience. And when I did tell the board that we needed to do something on the harbour, I had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, but when I walked from the opera house around through the gardens um, and looked back and saw the harbour bridge and the opera house and the city of Sydney, I thought, wow, this is where we do it. And initially I thought of having a floating stage. And uh, <laughs> then I realised that... When every manly ferry went past, the whole stage oh, was in the wake. <laughs> exactly, yes, and yeah. we'd have people falling in the water. Uh, not to say, not to mention what the lights would be doing. So we uh, decided we would sink uh, pylons into the seabed. So there are sixteen permanent pylons in the seabed over there. And every year, when we go around to um, to set it up, we have to send divers down to find them because they get covered in mud. They're only oh about six or seven inches above the mud. And uh, we clear that away, and then with a crane, we lower uh, the deck onto those pylons on which we build the stave. So they fit into all those tubes, and there's a dog collar that fixes them. And then on top of that, we build the new design for whatever opera we're doing, or as we did with West Side Story Musical. Yeah. And, uh, and then you know, we build the enormous Northern Terrace where we've got, um, well, three restaurants fundamentally, and then the Southern Terrace with a restaurant... It's a huge infrastructure there, isn't it? It's massive. It's massive. But, you know, you see when people come in, their their faces light up. It's a very, very special place, and it's worked fantastically well for us. Were you nervous and anxious for that first production? Is it going to work? Yeah, Yeah. very. And it rained. We had cranes bogged in the mud. Well, this time of year, of course, it rains all the time, and we've just had a week of... I know, but this is supposed to be the the, the driest part of the time of the year. Right, right. (laughs) Which is, well, not the only reason we we chose it. We need to have it in uh, as close to summer as possible. But, um, you know, of course I was nervous. But um, once I'd seen um, one of the dress rehearsals, I thought, wow. This is going to work, mm. and we just you're throwing some fireworks. Exactly. Yeah. Well, when Fran- I asked Francesca Zambella to direct it, 
And I said, and we're having this, 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 and we're having fireworks. And she said, oh, Lind and fireworks? I said, yeah, we're having them. Oh, really? Yeah. So all through the rehearsal period, she'd say to me, oh, come on, you know, we don't need fireworks. So we got to the dress rehearsal, and we had it, it was an open dress, and there were a lot of people there. The fireworks went off, and the crowd went bananas. Mm. And so she turned to me and said, OK, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it's such a Sydney thing. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's been so successful with tourists, is that it encapsulates the culture of Sydney. And there's a lot of audience here who've never seen an opera before. Fifty percent of the people who buy a ticket have never bought an opera, wow. bought an opera ticket, and we get a transfer, or we were getting a transfer of about twenty-five percent from that, which mm. is fantastic. Well, there's a lovely chandelier in La Traviata, which you can save for next year. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's exactly. So you can save some costs there. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> The opera company is 65 years old, is it? Uh, right about that? Yes, we had our 60th a few years ago, yeah. Various incarnations, the Elizabethan Theatre Trust That's Opera right. Company, the Australian Opera, and in 96, Opera Australia. Mm. Is that, that's all just rebranding or...? Yeah, I think so. Look, look, to be frank about it, I'm not sure why uh, the company decided not to continue to call it the Australian Opera. Uh, frankly, I think that, that sits better mm. than Opera Australia. It's a bit less uh, pretentious. And it also conveys exactly what it is. It's the Australian Opera Company. Um, You know, as you have the Metropolitan Opera Company and so on. Um, Yeah, look, I think it probably was rebranding, but, um, you know, I wasn't here then. Uh, But, um, look, I wouldn't mind if we went back to calling it the Australian Opera. Uh, You you go to ballet companies and opera companies overseas Mm. in Europe and and America, and in the program there's a list of sponsors and people have donated money. Mm. Do we need to be better at philanthropy in Australia? I mean, you you don't have that love of the arts or sponsorship of the arts by individuals. No, it's a good question. And, um, you know, obviously the Americans uh, have an extraordinary tradition. And it's, it's because they've never had government funding Mm, it's always been provided by people who've done well you know the Carnegie's of course uh, you know building something like Carnegie Hall because you think it's the right thing to do extraordinary we started off with the British system which was um, government funding and I think it's unfortunate that we we adopted that system because it's not like the German system where it is and the French system where it really is uh, a, a very large subsidy. Um, you know, our subsidy is 20% of our total budget. And if we were only relying on the subsidy, well, we'd have to close. Um, but whereas in Germany, 87% of their total budget comes from the government. Um, so we're neither one thing or the other. Mm. And I think because we have always had that sort of um, Clayton's uh, funding system, um, Big business and individuals have never felt that they've that they should do it, or they've had to do it. They felt that oh well, the government's supporting it, so I don't need to do it. Yeah. Um, and it's difficult to change that culture. It's difficult to you know then go to people and say, well, you know, actually the government doesn't give us much at all. Um, we're very grateful for it, but um, you know we sell more tickets than anyone in the world, and we have to. Mm. I mean. And, in 2019, we sold 600,000 tickets. Wow. It's a huge number of tickets. Mm. Um, and if we didn't, then, you know, we wouldn't be doing well. Um, so it's it's difficult uh, to change a culture overnight, but but we do need to. We, uh, in, the, in the future, we'll need to rely much more on, um, on the generosity of donors, sponsors, uh, corporations, and anyone, really, who feels that... Um, It's their social responsibility to contribute to the culture of the the place that we live in. What have been some of the challenges of leading a national company through a pandemic? Um, Look, there are a number of challenges. Uh, Some of them are pretty obvious. Um, You know, when you lose $75 million in ticket sales, it's a lot of money to lose. And uh, we spent $30 million uh, cash in maintaining... Uh, people in the organisation. Um, so that sort of thing worries you when you see that much money going out the door. Um, but I think one of the things that we haven't talked about a lot is is the mental state of, of uh, artists, and not only the artists, but 
you know, other people working for the company, um, when something like this, uh, like COVID-19, goes on for so long. You know, if it's for a month, well, you can deal with it. <clears throat> but when it keeps going and, um, you know, people have got families and mortgages and everything mm. else, they start to worry whether they'll, they'll ever come back. And if they can't come back, and, you know, we maintain people with the help of JobKeeper, but, um, you know, we kept paying people, um, how long is that going to continue? Um, you know, for some of the time we had people on 50% and 75% of their salaries. And when that happens, people think, well, maybe it'll stop soon and I won't have anything. Yeah. And that takes a very heavy toll on, on people uh, in a psychological way. And uh, then, you know, when they are coming back to work, and some of them, you know, were working as motor mechanics and builders and labourers and all sorts of things to make, make ends meet, mm. then, you know, you can't suddenly come back in and have the dexterity to play a first violin. You know, it takes a while to get, you know, all those muscles responding. That maintenance of your skills. Yeah, and for singers too. A lot of singers live in fairly small apartments. Well, if you're a Wagnerian and you start singing, <laughs> then um, people start banging on the walls and yeah. the ceiling and everything else. Um, and then at that time it was difficult for people to find a space where they could sing. And, you know, singing is like any other instrument. If you don't practice then the muscles stop working and you can't just kind of come in and think right I'll sing the ring today yeah you know it's like running a marathon if you're not you know exercising every day exactly. going to the gym working out exactly yeah. and then it simply doesn't happen mm. so then it takes a while for those skills to come back you've got to build build stamina again um, you know build your re remember what flexibility is about um, and that can be frustrating for singers and musicians you know, when you feel, ah, oh, damn, you know, I could do this. What's wrong? Where is it? Um, but, you know, I remember years ago, I was, a, I was a young singer here, and there was a wonderful tenor, Donald Smith, and, uh, you know, he had some very wise things to say. And he said to me, you know, if you have a month off, it'll take you a month to get back. Right. And it's pretty accurate. Yeah. When you've had six months off or nine months off, then you're looking at a long period before you're really back to the form you're in when uh, you stopped. So that sort of thing really affects people. They start to doubt themselves and wonder whether it's ever going to come back. Uh, maybe they won't be able to sing or play again at the level that they, they played at. Um, and that's the tools of their trade. That's what absolutely. keeps them employed. Exactly. Mm. Apart from the, 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 the depression that comes through not working. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are can go out in the garden if you've got a garden and dig up a, a, a few petunias but they're you know you, you start getting sick of that and thinking well, you know is this it for the rest of my life what am I going to do so I think that aspect of it um, hasn't been documented in any serious way and um, it was a very very important part of uh, what people have been going through I feel for the young artists as well you know who are in training institutions or just yeah. starting their career yeah and everything's just come to this grinding halt. Yeah. I mean, look, the, the, the whole business has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. And, um, you know, fortunately, we did do different things. And, uh, you know, Opera on the Harbour has been very successful. The musicals have been. Even The Ring has been very successful. And we've we've um, made money from it. Uh, and The Ring we're doing at the end of this year, uh, no government funding goes to that. We do it totally as a commercial exercise. So we're the only company on, in the world who does the ring as a commercial exercise and makes it work. Wow. Um, but we have to do that. And so because we've shifted the company to be fundamentally a production house, uh, we've managed to survive and, and do well. But, you know, if you're, if, if you're in New York at the moment, for example, and uh, the Met is closed, it's closed till at least September, but, you know, none of us think it's going to open in September... Um, what do you do? And you've come out of Juilliard or the Sydney Conservatorium or wherever and, uh, you know, full of aspiration about your life as an artist and suddenly it's not there. I worry about those opera houses too or, or any theatres which have had the ghost light on for so long. Mm. I heard a story, um, a local cinema here, because it had been so dark for so long, 
mice had started to oh. come into the auditorium and mm. just look for the you know the odd popcorn that yeah, was left yeah, in yeah. chairs and they were ruining seats and all that yeah. sort of thing. So there's all those Absolutely. knock-on effects that yeah. you don't really think about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the saddest thing of all is a dark theatre. You know, it's a, you go into a theatre where all the lights are off and it's, it's a sad and depressing place. You turn the lights on and it's a magical place. Mm. So, you know, taking that away and that spirit that, you know, a lot of us feel lives in a theatre anyway, mm. is, um, it's a difficult thing. And I mean, the business is so hard now. I, honestly, I wouldn't want to be starting out now. Mm-hmm. It's, um, you know, all over the world, it's, it's a different time. And, um, you know, people will have to be extremely talented for a start. I mean, that's always been the case. But, you know, now I think uh, the expectation from people is higher than it's ever been. And not only be extremely talented, but also extremely versatile, mm. and be able to work in different aspects of the theatre um, will be an important thing in the future. Well, when it all stopped, I think around about then you introduced OATV. Mm, we which, did, which was a great way, I guess, to continue that um, connection with your audience mm. and also to to talk to various creators, mm. so they could continue to tell their stories. Mm. Look, it's been terrific. We've had over a million people look at it, and 70,000 people have watched an entire program, which you know, can be three hours. Mm. So we yeah, were surprising, really. We didn't um, think that it would be as popular as it is. And uh, we got lots of emails about it and all the rest of it. It's almost like having a TV show. It's extraordinary. Well, you're doc- documenting terrific stories of our heritage, mm. theatre yeah. heritage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And look, people have, have loved that, which is nice. Um, look, there have been interesting things about that too because uh, a number of our patrons have, have either written to me or called me and said uh, they started watching the, um, the DVDs or videos or whatever we had, um, but they enjoyed the, the, the interviews much more. Mm. And I think it's a general thing, that, and it certainly was the case with the Met, that uh, after a while the novelty of uh, seeing opera on a screen starts to wear off. You know, it's something you have to see in the theatre. And it's the same with a big musical. Yeah. You know, you need to be there. And it's, you know, about the, the connection between those performers on stage and you sitting in the theatre. And, and it's not the same when it's a screen and the screen is, yeah. is a, yeah. a film of, you know, from the theatre. And it's ephemeral. I mean, that experience Absolutely. that you, you have that night yeah. and it will stay with you. Well, it's a unique experience yeah. because the next night it's different. Mm. Mm. And I think people have missed that. And, um, and look, that's encouraging and heartening in all sorts of ways too because, you know, we want people to miss the theatre and we want people to, to come, come to the theatre and, and have that experience that um, you can't have in any other way and, or in any other medium. But your conversations also have given us great insight to uh, what a, a chorus master does yeah, or a principal yeah. violinist exactly, or, yeah. you know, yeah. great that, behind the scenes knowledge. Yeah, yeah. and it, that was the idea and, and all, you know, there, there's sorts of roles that... Um, where don't, they don't get a lot of accolades, and so you don't hear exactly what they're doing on a day-to-day basis. Mm. But it's, um, yeah, it's fascinating, and the, sort of, and the amount of work that they put in is huge. You grew up in DY. I did, yeah. Was it a, a childhood of sand, sun and surf? Look, it was, actually. Yeah? I was the only mm. wog surfy in those <laughs> days. I even tried to dye my hair with lemon juice. <laughs> that didn't go so well. No, do you? <laughs> it looked pretty young. I had orange hair in the front. Uh, but no, I went to DIY Public School. And um, look, it was an interesting time then, and particularly in, um, on the northern beaches. Um, there were very, very few people uh, or kids that had a foreign name. Mm-hmm. It wasn't an Anglo-Saxon name. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was one Chinese kid... And there was a kid, um, oh, Mark Tsarnoff was his name. I'm not sure where he was from. Uh, but uh, anyway, he was there. But apart from that, it was uh, a very wasp sort of environment. So, you know, when you're a kid, you want to fit in. And so I got a surfboard and started going to the <clears throat> to DY Beach, then to Long Reef. I used to surf at Long Reef. Right. Um, and really just to fit into that society because I... You know, as a kid whose parents were in the Salvation Army and I'd, you know, go to the Salvation Army on weekends and, you know, I obviously look Italian and had a wog name and so um, I was an outsider from the did, very Did you cop any discrimination at oh, school? Oh, yeah, yeah, huge. Right. You know, um, various names from 
you know, well, you know, you start off with wog and get to dago and then kerosene tin and spaghetti eater and on it goes. <laughs> but look, well, you I'm know, glad you can laugh at it now. Did you? Could you laugh at it at the time? Oh, look, you you learn two things. Yeah. You learn to fight and you learn to run, <laughs> and um, you had to, you know, pick which one you were going to do. But um, yeah, look, oh, look, oh, look. I honestly don't think it it did me any harm. In fact, apart from the fact that. I realised by the time I got to high school that I was trying too hard to be like everyone else. And um, so then I stopped doing that. Mm. Um, and that was a good thing. But look, I, th- I think it certainly builds uh, resilience and uh, strength into your character. Um, because in the end, you know, it doesn't matter what people say, it's not going to hurt you anymore. Well, thank God for the Italians who've contributed such a, a magnificent culture yes, and diet yeah. to the country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and it's those stories of immigrant stories that are such a rich part of the tapestry of this oh, country, of any yeah. country, really, Absolutely. isn't it? I mean, we talk about music theatre again. Mm. We wouldn't have music theatre unless it was for the Jews and uh, exactly. that arrived at Ellis Island yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. the United States. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's an interesting thing because, you know, everyone's speaking about diversity now in the theatre. And... Um, you know, we've certainly been doing it here at Opera Australia since I've been here, and it was one of the um, the first things I spoke about. And the first production I did was a production of Love O.M. that Gail Edwards directed, and um, I cast a black Mimi and a Korean Rodolfo. And it was set in Berlin. The production is set in Berlin, and you know, it wasn't inconceivable that they could have both been studying there. But um, oh, that caused some outrage amongst our, some of our uh, patrons. Yeah. But uh, for me, I thought, well, you know, this is a kind of normal thing to do. And we've always done that, you know. It's, um, uh, we've certainly been colourblind in, in, uh, in that it doesn't matter where people come from. Um, we had a, a baritone from Mongolia singing Rigoletto in Melbourne. Wow. And he was sensational. Right. Maybe the greatest baritone alive. Yeah. So from my perspective, is look, if people are good enough, then we'll make it work. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, and I think, as you were saying, that that's a vital part of, a, of Australia mm. and who we are as Australians. Mm. And um, because of that cross-pollination and that hybrid nature of who we are, I think has made us an incredibly strong, resilient and inventive race. You know, we're a lot more... We, we take a lot more risks than the Brits might, for example. Um, and we're not like the Americans in that, you know, we don't beat our chests and tell everyone how fabulous we are. We have a, a more understated, quiet way of doing things, mm. and it's terrific. Mm. And I think that you know certainly does give us that inner strength, and I think that's a great characteristic that um, Australians of all generations have. What was the first opera you saw? It was Turandot. Huh? Oh, well, it was sort of the first opera I saw. The first one was really Otello, but I didn't see it. A friend of mine at university said um, oh they're, they're, they're looking for extras for the opera and we get paid oh. and I said well oh, let's do it so I went to a rehearsal was in the showground in I don't know one of those buildings there of Otello and it featured this uh, Italian tenor Umberto Borso and John Shaw the great Australian baritone was singing Iago and the chorus was there and they had a piano and I was standing there and they all started singing I was like, Whoa, what is that? This is incredible. So anyway, it didn't work out. I don't know why we didn't, I didn't get a job as an extra, probably because I was just standing around listening to them because I'd started singing at that stage. And uh, so then I got a job at the Elizabethan Theatre in Newtown for a production of Turandot. And Graham Murphy was also an extra in that. And uh, Donald Smith was singing Cullough. Uh, and... Every performance, after I'd finished carrying my spear or whatever I was doing, I would go around and stand in the wings and just listen to him sing Nessun Dorma. Mm. It was the best thing I'd ever heard, mm. and uh, long before it was a pop song. Uh, so that was really my inspiration of thinking, I'd really like to do that. And um, so I had to have some singing lessons as part, part of my course. And fortunately, I ended up with um, uh, Madame Marty, it was the sort of doyen of singing teachers in Sydney. And uh, she said to me one day, you should think about being a singer. And I said, what? I didn't... I, I didn't well, apart from the people... Were you I'd studying music theater. at uni? Yeah, I was, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, apart from the people I'd met in the, I'd never seen an opera singer, never heard mm. of an opera singer. 
So your career aspirations, you were, you were going to be a music teacher? Or yeah, or I was. Yeah, oh, right, I was okay. going to be a teacher. Right. Yeah. Um, and then um, oh, the Sydney Stepford came around. She said, so you should sing in this section, this section. This, and it was all under 21s. And um, look, apart from Graham McFarlane, who we farewelled the other day, um, there wasn't anyone else that you know was very good, so I ended up winning a lot of the stuff. And the ones that I didn't win, Graham won. So, was, <laughs> so we've known each other a very, very long time. And then people started, like John Milson, uh, started offering me things. And uh, so I ended up doing these shows. And I remember the first real opera I did was uh, Hugh the Drover by Ray Fawn Williams. And I was singing The Sergeant. And my fee for the entire season was $50. So I bought myself a makeup box uh, and kitted it out with everything that I'd need. There used to be a place in Pitt Street in Sydney where you could buy makeup and fake wigs and all that sort of thing. Your car, your car mine. That's right, your car mine, that's right, (laughs) yes. Uh, So I bought this makeup box and I used it uh, for my entire career. Wow. And it was, um, yeah, it was a great thing to do and it was very sentimental. So your operatic debut is in 1976? Well, that was with uh, the Australian Opera. Oh, with with OA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, sang Albert Herring. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with Bob Gard, who just passed away. Yeah, dear Bob. Yeah, Yeah, Bob was the mayor. Very, very funny. Look, the scenes, didn't matter what opera that he and Neil Warren Smith were in, they were always hysterically funny. And the scene uh, at the table when Albert has to get up and give his speech, there were notes being passed, the mayor had to give a speech and so on. And the interplay with Bob and Neil Warren Smith was just hysterical. Some nights I I just couldn't sing. I was laughing that much. (laughs) And I remember them both in uh, the the last act of Figaro in uh, the Nightmare song. One of the funniest things I've ever seen on the operatic stage. But it was was great to debut with those sorts of people. Um, They were not only terrific singers but terrific actors. And so, you know, watching them... And watching how they developed their craft uh, was tremendously uh, beneficial to me. Al Cimarron. Yep. You were Hans uh, van Henser. Adelaide Festival. That's right, yeah. And, and he was um, conducting too, wasn't he? Well, he came and directed it because um, we did it without a conductor. Uh, but that look, that was fantastic. I'd been working on it. I was singing Guglielmo in Cosi van Tutte in Melbourne at the Princess Theatre with opera, or the Australian Opera. And on weekends, or when I, if I had a few days free, I would fly up to Sydney and rehearse with uh, the other three musicians. And so, you know, then uh, we went to Adelaide for the festival, and Hans van Henser arrived, and uh, we started doing it, and, um, well, he said he was impressed, and so that was very nice. Uh, so he decided he would direct it, and um, it was great. So then he invited me to go to Italy to sing in the first Montepulciano Festival, and to sing in uh, a new production of um, Don Quixote or Don Quixote uh, by Paisiello that he had rearranged for orchestra and town band. And so we did it in the big main piazza in Montepulciano with windmills at every exit. And uh, that was a great experience. Real windmills or sets? Uh, well, they were sets, Sets, yeah. right, OK. So it's... Um, but it was, um, it was a fantastic time. And... Um, and again, that experience uh, formulated well, the, a, a lot of a, immersive theatre, I guess. Yeah, when completely. you've got the, the the community there. Well, it was you know in that, that time the Communist Party was uh, very strong and came the closest it ever came to being government in Italy. And uh, Hans von Hansen was a, a member of the party, um, and so everyone in the in the town was involved in the show. Women in the town were making the costumes. Kids were designing posters. You know, carpenters were building the set. And the town band was playing, and it was a, a great community experience, and that impressed me enormously. And um, like years later, when I was setting up Northern Rivers Performing Arts, Norpa, um, I, I thought of that a lot, and it was a big influence on what I did. So you're in Italy after, mm. what, is it only two big gigs, two professional gigs? Yeah, well, two at the highest level, yeah, that's yeah. true, yeah. Studying with uh, Fernando Bandera? Yeah, so I, I, I went and did the show in 1976 um, of Don Quixote and uh, went back every year to uh, just work with a couple of coaches and then uh, at the end of 79 I decided I'd move there and I uh, went to study with uh, Fernando Bandera, yeah. So what does that training consist of? What do you, what well, do you it was a there? completely different way of singing right. and uh, I was really singing with an Italian technique, you know, with the low larynx and all of that 
And um, so I took about two years just working with him three times a week. And, you know, I had some gigs, obviously, in between to pay for things. Um, but that, too, was an incredibly formative time. If I hadn't have done that, I certainly wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. So you lived in Italy for much of the 80s, I'd yeah, say. Yeah. So obviously you were studying and developing professionally, mm-hmm. but was part of it also getting back to your roots and, oh, yeah, and it was. knowing your heritage? And, yeah. yeah. And uh, I bought a place up on Lake Como, and I was singing a lot in Switzerland, in Germany, a few things in the States and, and in the UK, uh, then up into Scandinavia. And it was a very good place to live in that, you know, it was right on the border. The railway station was there, so I could be in Frankfurt in six hours. I could be in Zurich in three hours. And um, so it was, you know, it was a great place to live, and it was very beautiful. But certainly um, there were times when I'd be walking along the street, and I mean, this, this sounds a bit um, esoteric, I suppose, but, um, you know, I, wa- I would wonder whether my great-grandparents uh, or my great-great-grandparents had walked on the same street as me. And often I would, um, or not often, a few times, I, I would feel some sort of presence. And I have no idea what it was, and I'm not into ghosts and all that sort of stuff, but um, a few times I felt a real presence. Yeah. And uh, that, that affects you, you know. You, In the same way as when um, my grandmother was dying, uh, she lived next door to, to us in DY. And, um, you know, clearly it was her, her last hours. So the whole family was around the in her bedroom, around the bed, and I was there with my brothers. And uh, she was a very devout Christian salvationist for... Well, she was running a Salvation Army Corps from the time she was 18 years of age in Moolumba. And so, you know, it would have been a long life of um, religion. And just as she was dying, she sat up in her bed and just looked out and put her arm out and said, My Jesus! And died. No. Yeah. So she'd seen the light. Yeah. And, she was and you know, my brothers were really looking at each other. <laughs> Whoa, what was that? <laughs> But it's that sort of um, thing that comes out of nowhere mm. uh, that makes an enormous impression on you. And in, as I said, in Italy, I, I definitely felt some sort of presence on several occasions. Have you ever felt that in the theatre? You know, oh, yeah. The theatre is full of ghosts. Yeah, 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 and, uh, I have. Yeah, yeah and not in um, the same sort of way. It's been more a sense of déjà vu. Yeah. Of standing on a stage and thinking, I've done this before. And it's a, that's a weird sensation, too. Song where the women pull you up and call them a nation born in the night. These lovely ladies, fresh from the country, fill me with rapture, joy and delight. Fill me with rapture, joy and delight, joy and delight, joy and delight. Ask every girl to sing, make no distinction. Ask all the village, ride them with the gun, set them around sing, till they be like, ask all the village, joy and delight. All you can capture, all in my, ask all the village, joy and delight. Then for the men who pick them up, yeah, they are men. Well, as a baritone, it's quite a repertoire of roles. Classic works of Mozart with Don Giovanni and mm. Figaro and, and Escamillo in Carmen and Marcello in La Boheme. Mm. But also some extraordinary pieces that really challenge the performer and the audience, mm. no doubt. Mm. Have you ever... You, as a freelancer, you've had a great uh, variety and opportunity mm. for roles. Um, do you prefer the classical roles or the more contemporary? Look, it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, certainly when I started out... Um, everything was new mm. you know I didn't know any of these didn't know any operas I'd never seen one and so I loved the music and uh, you know starting out as a musician um, you approach things in a different way and so I was in love with the music and then I you know, became really intrigued by actors and acting um, and then when I'd sung a lot of these roles um, 
I started working with uh, composers and fortunately a number of pieces were written for me and I found that to be a, a fantastic thrill and so I did make a conscious decision but that was part of moving to Italy I decided that um, I didn't want to sing uh, the standard repertoire anymore I wanted to do new pieces and I wanted to do it to work with the composers and where I as much as I could to sing the title role um, and you know I still sang um, things from the standard repertoire but I felt other people did that better than me and uh, that you know I whatever talents I had I could utilize in contemporary pieces and uh, and I found them tremendously satisfying and I love working with composers um, and with Hans Werner Henze when he came uh, I was singing it in, in English and the English translation um, I didn't think was particularly good so I, I'd said to him look if I sang this here it would work with the notes that you've written better and you know I think it sounds better and he said oh okay well fine we'll do it and I did it and he said oh you yeah, know your version's much better let's do that <laughs> which was very gracious of him I must say and you know, looking back on it you think oh my god I don't believe I did that but um, it did give me confidence to be able to express my opinion with composers and with someone like Elena katz mm. you know often I've said to Elena oh, I think it'd sound better if I did this and she said Oh, yeah, okay, right. So you know, she would change it. And, and look, all of that is fantastically exciting. Yeah. And so I did um, ultimately prefer doing big new pieces, um, even though that's a lot more difficult, uh, certainly in Australia, uh, to generate audiences. Mm. And um, on occasions I did feel a bit disappointed and frustrated by that. But um, look, the thrill of of doing those pieces, uh, getting them right, and, um, and and the sense of satisfaction that you get um, was really terrific. Can we talk about a couple? Mm. Tell me about Richard Mille's opera about Frankenstein author, Mary yeah, Shelley. Mary de Glass, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, look, I think there were parts of that that are really terrific. Um, unfortunately, I don't think the first 20 minutes is very good. Uh, but after that, it's a terrific piece. And... Um, Look, it was there were difficult circumstances uh, doing that, but uh, and there were other aspects of it that um, I wasn't particularly happy or comfortable with. But there is some really beautiful music in it, and it was interesting playing Byron and, and the monster. Oh, both roles. Yeah. yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. What about singing atop a disembowelled horse <laughs> while being yes. while naked? Yeah, in, well, in Rosa. Yeah, well, that was in Amsterdam in the with the Netherlands Opera, fantastic theatre, huge theatre, one of the biggest theatres in the world, and wonderfully equipped, and uh, Peter Greenaway directed it. The film director. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Louis Andreessen is the composer, wonderful, wonderful composer, and it's a fantastic piece, it's huge, um, and that was really exciting, and there's some beautiful music in it, but enormous music, and difficult to sing, uh, both vocally and musically, uh, but Peter decided that... Um, uh, well, you know, the story is about this failed composer who uh, went to uh, South America and lived in an abattoirs uh, while he wrote music for, you know, um, uh, what are they, spaghetti westerns. Yes, yes. T- uh, Terence and, Stamp and... Yeah, that Arden. sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. And um, so then by living in an abattoir, he realised he preferred uh, horses to his wife. And so um, I was uh, that um, character who had sex with a horse and uh, it was a pretty wild show let me tell you your mama would congratulate you on your imagination on your liberal use of ink
There's a fabulous 20 minutes, I think, on YouTube uh-huh. that you, can, you can access, yeah, which yeah. is well worth a look. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a very exciting piece. It is. It's yeah. a wonderful piece. Yeah. Very, very difficult to do. In fact, I was supposed to do it at the Met, and it was actually too big for the Met. And so um, you know, that contract went away. Do you have to think twice about getting your gear off to, for a role? It never worried me, I no. have to say. Because you've done it a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, it never worried me, um, as long as... Oh, there were a couple of times I said, no, I'm not doing any of that, because I just thought it was gratuitous. But in the, in the shows that I did do it, um, I thought it was justified and, um, and also made the piece stronger. I mean, in Rosa, it was after Rosa had been shot... And so he was in a very, very vulnerable position and it made sense when the cowboys came and ripped his clothes off Mm, mm. and then crucified him to be that vulnerable and that naked. And so, yeah, I didn't have a problem with that. Um, There was a production of uh, The Burrow too uh, where I was naked. And again, it's about vulnerability. You know, if, if you're prepared to go there and make yourself that vulnerable... Um, you can get a lot deeper into the character. The performer and the audience. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so, yeah, on the times when I thought it was really worth doing, I did it. Incredibly theatrical works. Uh, are there more demands, do you think, being placed on the singers in uh, opera nowadays in the past 30 years? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, now, um, there's, you know, people are looking for younger people all the time. Uh, certainly people who are, um, you know, are slim. Well, I think of that extraordinary production of La Boheme, mm. of Baz Luhrmann. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When yeah, everyone yeah. looked the right age. Yes. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, with the one we did with, um, that Gail did too, with the Mimi and Rodolfo and all the boys, they all looked, you know, the right age. Mm. And, look, it does have a tremendously powerful, dramatic effect on an audience when you see someone that young dying. And tragically, you know, Taryn Phoebe, who was the Mosetta in that production from the very beginning, passed away yeah. on the weekend. Um, and that makes it particularly upsetting. And I think, you know, for the audience in the theatre, when people do look absolutely right for the roles they're playing, it affects them in a very different way. Music theatre again, and Stephen Sondheim. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you could say his works have operatic demands. Absolutely. You know, and it's certainly Sweeney Todd, for example, mm. has been a staple of many opera companies mm. for, for many years. But you played Todd in the premier Australian production. I did. You, in yeah, Adelaide. I did. That was a great production. Gail Edwards directed it again uh, with a fantastic cast. Really wonderful cast. You know, Nancy was my Mrs. Lovett. Uh, Greg Urasich was the judge. Tony Taylor. Peter Cousins. Uh, Peter Cousins. You know, really terrific people. I remember, I'll never forget it actually, um, when Tony at the end of the show uh, screamed out, Razor! And it just made your blood run cold. You yeah. know, it was fantastic. Poor old Tobias cops the blame for it all, doesn't exactly. he? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. But I remember, you know, particularly the Epiphany, uh, Have a Little Priest, it was such great fun with Nancy. And then, you know, doing the Epiphany before that and um, you know, when you're younger, you can be a lot more physical. So I used to jump from the top of a staircase down and confront the audience, and uh, they were great performances, I must say. And um, I enjoyed that tremendously. There's a hole in the world like a great black pit, and it's filled with people who are filled with shit, and the foreman of the world inhabit it. Because in all of the whole human race, Mrs. Lovett, there are two kinds of men and only two. There's the one saying foot in the other's face, and the one with his foot in the other one's face. Look at me, Mrs. Lovett, look at you. So we all deserve to die. Even you, Mrs. Lovett, even I. Because the lies of the wicked should be made before the rest of us. Death will be a relief. We all deserve to die. I will have 
salvation! You, sir! Two, sir! No one in the chair! Come on, come on! Sweeney, waiting! I want you, leaders! You, sir! Anybody! Gentlemen, and no beast time on one man! No, no, ten men! No, no, Even as he gloats, in the meantime I'll practice all this honorable throats. And my Lucy lies in ashes, and I'll never see my girl again. But the work waits. I'm alive at last. I did it in the UK, uh, did another season in Adelaide, and uh, no, I always enjoyed doing Sweeney very, very much. I met Stephen Sondheim because there was a, an event uh, that was organised at the Seymour Centre in 1977, I think it was January of 1977, and um, for some reason I got rung up and they said, oh, we've got Alan J. Lona, Hal Prince, Stephen Sondheim, and a director, Bud Whitney, Stone Whitney, coming for a music theatre conference. We want to do this concert and we'd like you to sing, you know, all these songs. And I said, sure. So they, we had this concert in the Seymour Centre uh, with piano. Harold Prince was the compere. And I sang On the Street Where You Live, If Ever I Would Leave You, They Call the Wind Mariah, um, With a Little Bit of Luck. Oh, all these songs. It was, and it was fantastic fun. And I remember very clearly it was before... Uh, Sondheim had written Sweeney Todd and all those wow. pieces yeah. he'd done a little night music and sent in the clowns had been a big hit and so they brought a woman from the States Phyllis I can't remember a second name and she was singing Send in the Clowns so Hal Prince introduced it and said well ladies and gentlemen you're about to hear a medley of Steve's hit <laughs> Send in the Clowns <laughs> it was a great night and out of that um Again, someone rang me, I think it was Michael Shrimpton, and offered me a TV series, The Saturday Show. Wow. Which I did uh, every Saturday night and did the biggest songs from the musicals. Um, Soliloquy from Carousel, Camelot. Uh, we did... Um, uh, what else did we... Well, we did Showboat. Uh, so I sang Old Man River and all of that. Um, what was the show called? It was called, uh, inventively, The Saturday Show. <laughs> but it was, look, that was a lot of fun. So I did it for one season, and I'd sung all the big songs I wanted to sing, really. Mm. But in the first half, we used to, I used to sing, um, you know, popular songs from um, those periods. She's Funny That Way, and songs like that. Um, I think you can find all this stuff on YouTube. But that, look, it was, it was a lot of fun. I certainly enjoyed doing it. And, and I think my appreciation for those great musical songs that uh, was born there was Sweeney your final performance it was yeah, yeah in the UK right um, did Sweeney there and um, yeah I loved it it was um, uh, a look if ever I was going to do uh, anything ever again I would probably do Sweeney Todd and still Sweeney or would you have yeah. a crack at the judge or? look I'd still do Sweeney I mean yeah. I think too when I did it in the past look realistically I was too young right um, and now I'm probably the right age but um, it would be a different sort of performance than Would you like be. to perform again? Oh look I don't know I haven't got time at the moment yeah. I think it's weird because <laughs> people still ask me yeah. and uh, I've said to a few of them you must be nuts I haven't sung a note for years um, but look if I had time off uh, and time to practice and do all of that then um, who knows What role have you found the toughest? Um Oh, El Cimarron was very difficult. And when I decided to do it completely from memory, which no one had ever done, uh, by the end of the night, yeah, I was physically and mentally exhausted. Right. I remember I did it in Melbourne for the first time without a score and fully staged. And uh, by the time I got to the last page, I was oh, and I sat in my dressing room, I was just like a zombie. Even the first time I did it in Adelaide, 
uh, I remember very clearly turning that big page and the, the line on the last song is, maybe I will die tomorrow. It's the right. first line. Right. And I remember as I was delivering the line, I thought, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it through this piece. Because I have to say, you know, when you're looking at an hour and a half with no one else flat out, it's, it's daunting. Right. And, you know, probably when you're young, uh, you know, young and foolish, you'll have a go at anything. Uh, but I really didn't know whether I could get through it until the first night. Mm. And uh, again, when I did it from memory, it was more mental exhaustion than physical, I guess. But just sitting in the dressing room, I was just whoosh, wiped out. So nearing the end of your life as a performer, mm. were you thinking about what what's next? What am I going to do next? Um, so where oh, did I administration decision. and producers come along? Yeah, no, I made a conscious decision. I was in Amsterdam for the revival of Rosa. So we did it in 94 and then in 98. And uh, I was standing there and, um, oh, you know, there were wonderful responses. We had standing ovations every night and, you know, people would go into a restaurant to have dinner and the whole restaurant would stand up and applaud. And, you know, it was really heady days. But I remember taking a curtain call there one night and, and consciously thinking, um, I don't want to do this anymore. And uh, it was... During the time that I'd started um, Norpa uh, in Lismore, and uh, I just uh, felt it was the time, and I suppose I was influenced by that time in Montable China, so I was working with uh, a lot of uh, kids in in Lismore, and um, one thing led to another, and then uh, I was offered the Queensland Biennial Festival of Music, and then the Brisbane Festival, and I combined that with the River Festival, and I accepted them. Whereas in the past, people had offered me things that... Well, they weren't as big as that, but they'd offered me different things that were um, really roles for an artistic director, and I'd said no. But then, after having made that decision in Amsterdam, I thought, yep, this is what I want to do, and this is the right time for me to do it. So, Northern Rivers Performing Arts, it's Mm. giving you an opportunity also to move into other areas of of other disciplines. Yeah, and again, the theatre. I I learnt... With all, all these, all the things that I've done, um, they were incredible learning curves for me. At Norpa, um, I had to learn you know, how to run a company, how to raise money, um, how to budget. And it's not that I'm an accountant, but you know, I can add up. And um, you know, if we didn't have enough money, then I'd had to go and raise more money and so on. Um, so that was a fantastic uh, learning experience. And it was a great... You know, I enjoyed it enormously. And originating and film. developing new works like The Cars mm. That Ate Paris, yeah, exactly. which was just stunning. I saw that at a Perth festival. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah well, I wrote the, the music with a guy called Fred Cole and, um, you know, um, directed it and everything else. And um, suddenly, you know, it was a hit and people wanted to do it at festivals and so on. So that was great fun. Mm. It was great fun. And people have asked me if I'll uh, direct uh, operas and so on. And um, I almost, this last year I was thinking of doing something and in the end I decided I wouldn't, mainly because there wasn't enough work around for directors anyway. Uh, But look, if I stop uh, doing this, then maybe I'll do that. Yeah. Um, Tell me about wooing Mikhail Gorbachev. (laughs) Yes. Well, that was an amazing experience. How did you pull that off? Well, it it was was extraordinary, actually. I was running the Brisbane Festival and I felt that festivals needed to have more of a voice uh, in the community and this was before uh, climate change, sustainable development and resource management uh, was popular. Uh, But Gorbachev was running an organisation called Greenpeace International which is sort of like um, the Red Cross really but it was for the the environment. And um, through various people... um, I, uh, I, just, I went to Rome to meet him because he was having a big Green Cross, in, uh, not Greenpeace, Green Cross yes. International. He was having a big Green Cross um, uh, gathering and there were branches all over the world. So I went there and I met uh, his assistant, Alexander Ligatile, who was the general manager of Green Cross at the time. And I said to him, well, look, we've got this festival and we want Gorbachev to come. Uh, we want to have this world forum in Brisbane about uh, climate change, sustainable development and resource management. 
and uh, he said, okay, well, and he started giving me budgets and all that sort of thing. And I said, well, I, th I think I can manage that. And um, so I had a meeting with Gorbachev and there were different countries. There was Italy and Japan and they were all bidding for it. And uh, there was a lot of skullduggery going on too, I have to say. Um, so I spoke to Anna Bly, who was the treasurer at the time. And I said, look, I reckon I've got a chance of getting this, but, you know, we'll need some money. We'll need some fairly serious money. And she said, look, this is great. Let's do it. Um, so then she was going to Europe and um, um, we agreed that we would go... To, uh, she was going to go to Milan to meet the, the Gorbachev Foundation. And then two days before she left, she rang me uh, and said... Um, do they speak English? And I said, no, they don't speak English. You'll have to have a translator. And she said, oh, I don't feel comfortable about that. Um, oh, can you come? And I said, oh, I guess so. So I did. And uh, we got there and met them and uh, negotiated. And uh, then I had another meeting after that. Uh, anyway, to get cut a long story short, we managed to get it. So Mikhail Gorbachev came to Brisbane with Alexander Likital and um, they fell in love with the place, actually. And it was an amazing time because we organised this big um, opening um, opening day for Gorbachev to give an address. And uh, five minutes after we put it on sale, it was sold out. Wow. wow. And he stood up in the Brisbane Town Hall. And I wanted to do it in the Brisbane Town Hall because that's where all the famous addresses have taken place in Brisbane. And um, he gave the speech that he couldn't give and when he was president of the Soviet Union. And, um, oh, he went after the Americans, went after everyone. Wow. And at the end, um, the whole audience just stood, people with tears rolling down their cheeks. It was amazing. And his translator, you would recognise from seeing him on television, he looked like Comrade Lenin. And uh, so he translated all of this. And uh, before it, uh, I said to Gorbachev, and he pretended he didn't speak English, but he understood a lot more than he let on, uh, do you want, will you take questions? No, no, yet. Okay, fine. So at the end, people wanted to ask questions. We were standing up and cheering. And he turned to me and said, Questions? And I said, you said you didn't want any questions. <laughs> so Barry Jones asked a very long-winded question and a lot of other people. And it was an extraordinary time. And he had a great time there. And uh, the Lord Mayor... Uh, wanted to plant trees after that, set up a Gorbachev Foundation in Brisbane. I don't think it functions now, but for, for a time there it was an amazing period. So it was it was a wonderful thing to do, and, um, and I think it gave people a different perspective on um, the state of the environment and everything else at that time. Well, there's certainly been a vast range of experiences that you've had as a performer mm -hmm. and, and a producer, an actor, an administrator, which make you the ideal candidate, I think, to be uh, AD at the Opera Company. Well, as I've said to people, you know, virtually everything I've, everything I've done has been an apprenticeship for yeah. this. Yeah. Um, you know, learning how to raise money and things that you don't expect an artistic director to do or have to do, uh, but it's, that's a very important part of this. Being entrepreneurial now is a vital part of it. Um, you know, making sure that you know you've got the right shows. Um, you know, the time I spent in Italy, particularly with um, older singers, uh, people who've been in the business for a long time. Um, so you really start understanding the sort the sorts of voices that you need to sing different roles. That was incredibly important for me. Um, you know, singing the big pieces with in you know, big theatres all over the world, that was important too because you actually uh, then understand or see what system is working and what isn't. Yeah. And so you learn very quickly, well, we're not going to adopt that system because that was a disaster. And, you, and I suppose in the end you cobble a system together from different areas and based on the experience you've had um, that works for this, for an Australian culture and in an Australian society. What's your favourite part of the job? Um, well, the happiest I am, whether I'm, I'm considering it work or not, is when I'm in a theatre. Yeah. And if there's a really fabulous performance, uh, like Tosca recently, you know, I think the last performance of Tosca in this run is the best performance of Tosca I've ever seen anywhere. 
Because I believe you're going to see things several times. Oh, I go nearly every night. Right, right. Yeah. There are very few shows I miss. Right. And, um, you know, I, I was sitting there and, you know, that's when I'm at my happiest. Yeah. I love being in the theatre. Love uh, being in great performances. And when I was uh, living in Italy, uh, it was a great period, period for La Scala then. Claudio Gobaldo was the um, chief conductor and artistic director, I think. And uh, the greatest singers in the world sang at La Scala in every opera. And uh, the Tosca that we did here, certainly the last performance, was the same feeling I had when I was in those Scala performances. And that's, um, you know, there, the, the nights when you leave the theatre, you know, just on a cloud. It's the most special thing uh, in my experiences, being present in those sorts of performances. Well, no doubt you'll be um, at Hadda on Sydney Harbour with I'll be down in a few minutes. <laughs> a few minutes. Um, this will go to air on opening night, so uh-huh. chalk us for another triumphant yeah. season. Yeah. It'll be, we're all looking forward to it. And um, thank you so much for your time and, and generosity of anecdote today. It's been wonderful, Linton. Thank you. No, it's an absolute pleasure. I mean, it's, it's always a joy to talk about the theatre. Stages was most fortunate to capture Linden. As you can imagine, he is a busy fellow at the moment, thanks to the staff at Opera Australia for assisting in making this episode possible. You might also like to catch Linden's audio-visual series of conversations with opera creatives by accessing OATV. Simply go to Opera Australia's website and search for OATV. They're terrific discussions and history, just like stages. A Treviata plays March 26 to April 25 in a glorious infrastructure built at the Fleet Steps, Mrs Macquarie's Point, in Sydney. Experience the joy and heartache of the world's most popular opera, La Traviata, at Sydney's best night out. Giuseppe Verdi's music is sensational, delivering soaring melodies and terrific drama. My thanks to Brian Castles Onion and Desiree Records for assistance with the vocal tracks featuring Lyndon Terracini in this episode. Brian is, of course, the conductor for La Traviata and has been a guest on stages, along with Traviata's set designer, Brian Thompson, another guest, now joining Lyndon in the stages archive. Traviata is directed by Constantine Costi, based on an original production by Francesca Zambello. It's been a great episode, hasn't it? Thanks for joining us. I'm Peter Ayers. Keep well, keep warm, and I'll catch you next time.